He is a grade A enigma, a self-styled, handcrafted, homemade puzzle. A white Mississippi backwoods Baptist preacher who sheltered nine black children from a Little Rock mob. He's a deeply religious man, one who has a, a great breadth of spirit, uh, calm, wise, witty, eloquent, uh, courageous. A Yale-educated intellectual and a friend to members of the Ku Klux Klan. For him, it's the, it's, the, it's the ultimate challenge to find the connecting link between people who are really very different. A farmer and amateur country musician, and the only white person at the founding of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He identified with uh, black people and with what segregation meant. At the same moment, he uh, worked among his own people to uh, help them come to uh, salvation in a way, personal and social. A counselor with a reputation as a curmudgeon. And I expected this Jehovah-like figure. Instead, I got to the farm and found this nasty piece of work who could barely give me the time of day. Well known and respected by academics and theologians, he is the subject of four books and the author of 15, including a finalist for the National Book Award, but he is content to remain obscure. An unlikely candidate, perhaps, for the role of modern-day prophet. But such has been the intensity of Will Campbell's unflinching search for meaning in his life and the life of his country. You know, every once in a while, the South uh, throws up one of these prophetic figures who uh, speak out of the South's tradition, but against some aspects of it. But they speak with an authority uh, that most critics of the South can't, can't bring to bear. Will Campbell is an articulate and authentic witness to what is the best of humanity. He should be one of the models that America lifts up for what it means to be uh, an American, what it means to be a human being. Now of my noise done had your fill I believe it's time for big brother Will you want to hear some stories later on some songs I'll bring on brother Will we can't do him wrong well, come on there's a family the first family not the one that, you know, that we call the first family, but the real first family, you know. Uh, right off, uh, Mama called Daddy one day and said, one of the young'uns has killed the other one. And Daddy Adam said, which one? And he said, well, I can't tell, but one of our children has killed the other one. And Adam said, oh my God, why can't we go back to the good old fashioned values? Why can't we go back to the way things used to be? <laughs> but I don't want to get into that. I've never been one to uh, get involved in any kind of controversy. <laughs> Brother, mother, friend of mine. 1960, the Nashville sit-ins. Will Campbell is an advisor. He would be a major player in nearly every campaign in the South, but it alienated him from his own people. I knew the South, uh, generic South, was wrong, but uh, it was my South. We all have a history, and I think until you come to terms with your history, you can, you're not a a full person. But that Mississippi magic is Mississippi man was not. That Mississippi magic 
is Mississippi madness now. Why I don't like black people? Black don't like white no how. Now, on the modest 40 acre farm near Nashville, where he and wife Brenda have raised corn, tomatoes, and three children, Campbell seems to have come to terms with both his conscience and his culture. The evidence of that union is, to say the least, diverse. An ordination from a country church purposely pasted over a Yale degree. A log cabin where Alex Haley and Robert Penn Warren took moonshine communion. A shack that sheltered a rabbi, a dying agnostic, and deserters from the Vietnam War. A homemade baptismal where Campbell has married convicts and country music stars. Without boasting, I have many friends. Some of them are old, some of them are young, some of them are white, some of them are black, some of them are straight, some of them are gay, uh, some of them are Christian, some of them are heathen, some of them are Jewish, some of them are Catholic, some of them are nothing. Uh, I don't know how to phrase this without sound, sounding terribly presumptuous. I don't recognize the concept of different kinds of people. In a sense, Campbell has become what he once was, a simple country preacher, but one who neither pastors nor attends a church, depending, of course, on the definition of church. For Campbell, the church is the community. There's a little tavern that we go to quite often. I, you know, married the people, buried the people, and, uh, got them out of jail or tried to, and so on. Every one of them, without exception, if I called them, they would be at my house as quickly as I could get there, and I would be at theirs. That is church. And so is this. In the last four decades, he has logged thousands of miles a year practicing the gospel according to Campbell. How would you explain somebody who is outside a prison where an execution's going to take place one day and at Harvard giving a speech to the Neiman fellows the next, the phone rings, somebody needs him. He's on a plane. He's gone. He never looks in his wallet except to get a credit card out. And yet he could not bring himself to call and say, you owe me some money for this. And three weeks ago, I marched hand in hand with and in support of my brilliant and beautiful lesbian daughter. Still highly active politically, his positions, like his life, defy conventional characterizations. He campaigns against the death penalty, war, and abortion. He supports the right of women, gays, and minorities, and approves of affirmative action, but mistrusts the power of government. And while preaching his radically primitive Christianity, he saves his harshest words for the religious establishment. That what goes under the guise and the name of Christianity today is so far removed from anything Jesus and the apostles could possibly have had in mind as to be unrecognizable. He disdains the Christian coalition, calls televangelists electronic soul molesters, and when once invited to New York's opulent Riverside Church, delivered what, for admirers, became a legendary condemnation. So the question we are really asking is, what can we do about race and racism in American culture and keep all this? The answer, my brothers and sisters, is nothing. You're in for a treat with um, Will Campbell, and if you don't know who he is, hopefully you'll know a little bit more about, arguably, the most important white man in modern civil rights history. And that would include even Clarence Jordan, who founded uh, Koinonia Farms and basically was the foundation underneath uh, Habitat for Humanity and also uh, Carlisle Marney, who was maybe the most profound theological voice across the South for at least 25 years. Uh, I would put Will Campbell um, above them 
in terms of importance and legacy. Will Campbell's dates are 1924 to 2013. And a question that many of you, I'm sure, is are asking is, who is Will Campbell? You know, who was he? I want to suggest that he's all of these five titles. He's Preacher Will. He was known as Brother Will, especially in the Nashville country music scene. He was often called Reverend, and this would be in the Black clergy community as well as the Black protest community. He was a prophet, uh, according to many commentators later, and he was also a friend. And a lot of people who knew him in either official capacities or in in the movement eventually would basically call him a friend. Now, remember that friend of God is a very, very, very important term in the Bible, and um, it could be very easily attached to Will Campbell. These are a lot of pictures of Will from the very beginning with his uh, capacity. He may have been a a, a kind of country music uh, writer, music uh, songster wannabe. Uh, he played at the beginning, as in that upper left-hand corner, and he played at the very end as the very, very kind of frail picture of him over on the right-hand side. I've included his civil rights activism, symbolized by the three shots of him being with Ralph Abernathy, and this is on the evening of uh, Dr. King being killed on the 4th of April, 1968. And Will even going out on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, as you see in the lower left-hand side. Mm -hmm. His wife, Brenda, he married at the age of 22 after coming back from World War II. He served for two and a half years uh, as a medic because he would not bear arms. Uh, He had had one year of college at Louisiana College, and he went straight into the Army and served during World War II. Uh, Brenda, his bride, he always introduced her as my first wife, and he had a lively, impish sense of humor, which is captured somewhat in that color photograph of him smiling. His um, Amish hat that he wore frequently, uh, where he has his arms crossed, would lead Doug Marlette of the Charlotte Observer to immortalize him as the Reverend Will Be Done. And we'll look at uh, some books that uh, Doug Marlette put out uh, later on. And uh, uh, he wore these kind of hats and cane and crosses and a lot of other things everywhere he went. The picture of him at his desk in his cabin uh, is very typical. He was a writer for the last half of his life. He wrote novels and books essays, sermons. Um, the cabin in the lower right is, is uh, depicted. This was a scene from the, or a picture that the Los Angeles Times had when they ran his obituary. Uh, the picture of him at his kitchen table really depicts him how he worked. He worked in a very common way in his home, uh, organizing, inspiring, comforting, leading, and all the rest. I love the picture in the upper right-hand corner, which depicts him musing, looking at the world askance, not looking at you real directly. And that was a typical Will Campbell countenance. But these are all the things that Will was. He was a preacher. He converted and was baptized when he was seven years old. He was ordained by uh, his father, uncle, and grandfather, at the age of 17 in Amit County, Mississippi. He would go on eventually to have a uh, Bachelor of Divinity equivalent to an MDiv these days from Yale University, but he would be involved with civil rights. He was at Little Rock. He was at Atlanta at the founding of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which Dr. King um, created. He was the only white man present for that. He was at the the very center of the student protest movement and the sit-in movement 
uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. I'll tell a story that he told me about John Lewis a little bit later. Uh, he was at Birmingham when uh, the dogs were unleashed and the fire hoses were turned on. Um, he, when Bull Connor was using the full force of his office and his meanness to try to tamp down the children's crusade there and uh, staunch uh, the movement for liberation. And he was also in Memphis when Dr. King was killed. He would create a thing called the Committee of Southern Churchmen, which he would chair, which was a loosely amalgamated group of people that really kind of served as a, uh, as a church, if you will, as a nonprofit organization that he would run and that would always be about reconciliation, looking at the fifth chapter of, the, of the, Paul's second letter uh, to the Corinthians, uh, calling people to be reg- reconciled. The journal called Catalagate is what he edited, and it had the likes of Jacques Ellul, William Stringfellow, uh, as well as Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was on the editorial board and contributed mightily to Catalagate. He was on the Southern, he created the Southern Coalition on Jails and Prisons because as he saw way before anybody else did, that the prisons were chock full more of black people than anything else and people that had been given the death sentence and were under the threat of the death penalty were by and large black folk all across the South. And he would arrange one attorney after another and defense fund one after another for people that were threatened with execution. He was an anti-institutionalist, meaning he thought all institutions were evil, even those that he appealed to for funding for his efforts, uh, the nonprofit philanthropic uh, institutions even. But he, he would say this at Vanderbilt Divinity School, where I first ran across him. He would say that in the middle of uh, downtown Presbyterian Church, where I heard him preach and where he supported the work that I was part of with a thing called Project Return, working with people leaving prisons and jails. He was a counselor to Nashville musicians. He was the roadie for Waylon Jennings' uh, road crew. He was hired as a cook. He couldn't cook worth a flip, uh, but uh, Jesse Coulter, Waylon's wife, wanted Will on there to help keep Waylon sober and also to kind of work on his soul. Uh, Jesse was a Pentecostalist, and she loved Will and thought Will could help save Waylon Jennings. He was an author of novels and essays and lots of books. Uh, He was a provocateur of the first rank, and he was known as a brother, Brother Will, to many, many people. I'm including some slides here of a trip that I took during a sabbatical some 20 years ago this year. It was in July through October that I took my sabbatical, and I went to visit Will over about a two or three day period on the coursing across the country from San Francisco all the way to New York City. Uh, Will and I had come to know each other and were friends in Nashville, but I wanted to sit down and really plumb the depths of his experience, his knowledge, his wisdom. On the left is a picture of his mailbox. And I wanted to put this up here because I asked Will, I said, that's a very unconventional mailbox, number 17. It's pipe, it's steel pipe. And he says, well, I put that up because I got tired of them blowing up with dynamite all the rest that I had. Uh, He was a target of hatred and uh, enmity by people who did not like his integrationist orientation and his liberation to the captives. Uh, So that was his mailbox. Uh, Dragonfly Crossing, that uh, very, uh, that little sign, Priscilla and I were able to find one for our own garden, and we have one. Uh, now that abides on our porch, but Dragonfly will come into play in just a moment as I'll share uh, just a moment. Next slide. This is Will's cabin out from his house where he and Brenda lived all of his life until his last year or so when he, his ill health and her ill health 
uh, required that they have uh, nursing care. Uh, and this is Will uh, and I spending some time. And a long time ago, as this is a, a long while ago uh, when this happened 20 years ago. In that cabin, uh, kind of if you went through that threshold and then into the inner sanctum, there's a door there on the left. And on the right, uh, there are pictures. And one of those pictures is of Thomas Merton with a Katalagate t-shirt. <laughs> and Will would meet with Thomas Merton in Elizabethtown in Kentucky and go and visit him quite a bit. Um, and um, both on nuclear weapons, integration, poetry, and the like. The picture on the right is called the Dolan House. And this is an out an outback house away from Will's main house. And Will would uh, harbor fugitives from uh, the FBI and the CIA and a bunch of other things, people who were on their way to Canada during the Vietnam War and did not want to be drafted, people who had been unjustly accused of fomenting violence in the integration movement, uh, but they had not done any violence, but they would stay the, here at the Dolan House. This is where you start if you're going to read Will, Brother to a Dragonfly is a recollection of his brother's addiction to alcohol and prescription medicine, and it didn't help that he was a pharmacist. The Glad River is a novel, and it has every bit of Will's wisdom, theology, perspectives, and a lot of stories that are wonderful. In one moment, on Easter Sunday, Dupes Momber, the protagonist of the novel, is drunk and goes to church, his mother's church, and kind of saunters down the middle aisle and proclaims to everybody what he believes is the Easter message. He, he ain't here. He is risen. But it is Will's commentary about the, the institutional church as well that he ain't in that institutional church. <laughs> at any rate, at the very end, Dupes Momber will be baptized by a man who was unjustly convicted and sentenced to death um, in a basin of a death row cell, uh, which he visits his friend Kingston Smiley. At any rate, or excuse me, Fordashe Arsenault is the person who does the baptizing and unjustly uh, accused. Cecilia's Sin is another novelistic treatment of Anabaptist history. Forty Acres and a Goal and Soul Among Lions are memoirs. God on Earth is a um, summary and explication, if you will, of the Lord's Prayer. Chester and Chun Ling is a children's book, and The Criminals with Him may be, I think, the very, very first book that Will edited. These last three on the right side, Reconciliation and Resistance, Crashing the Idols, and Conversations with Will D. Campbell are all very much post his death in 2013, uh, but are really, really excellent resources for plumbing the depths of what he stood for and what he believed. Doug Marlette, though, can also show you a side of Will Campbell. He immortalized him as the Reverend Will B. Dunn. The very first book was this book, Preacher, but he followed it up with There's No Business Like Soul Business. Uh, it was a bit of a parody of Will. It wasn't a, a condemnation of Will being a shyster and a fleecer of the flock, uh, but also he would get into I Am Not a Televangelist, <laughs> kind of combining Richard Nixon as well as Pat Robertson, uh, Jimmy uh, uh, Jim Baker and the and the like, a lot of fun. Uh, Doug Marlette had a lot of fun with Will. If I were to sum up three major themes in Will Campbell, I would say one is remember the neighborhood. And the neighborhood is what we have in the Christian community. It is what Josiah Royce called the beloved community, which Dr. King picked up on and made very, very thematically central to what his theology was all about. 
the neighborhood, being part of the neighborhood. And I think that he learned this from his father at the very, very beginning. This prayer, O Lord, look down on us with mercy, pardon and forgive us our sins, make us thankful for these and all other blessings. We ask for Christ's sake, amen. So Will is born in 2013. So he is a child, excuse me, 2023, 1923. He is a child of the depression. He lives his entire teenage years in the depths of the depression, in the depths of a poor state like Mississippi, where they barely have two nickels to rub together. Or as they used to describe my mother, she could, because she had to, squeeze the buffalo off the nickel. Will said about this prayer that he heard at every meal, those words made a deep impression on me and I began early to take them to heart. As the words took flesh, it was in relationship to other human beings. We lived in one of the most rural and presumably most racist counties in the nation. How then did I grow up to give my entire adult life to the struggle for racial equality and reconciliation? I learned lessons, lessons centered around my father's table and hearth, not mandated prayers in Caesar's schoolroom. <laughs> the neighborhood is central to Will Campbell. Radical grace is also absolutely foundational for understanding what he stood for and how his soul is a great soul. In one moment, a real nadir time in the civil rights mo movement, some students were murdered by a sheriff in, in Alabama. And Will was just grieving the, law, the loss of these lives. P.D. East, an atheist journalist who was really a champion for human rights all throughout the South and wrote a thing called Petal in Mississippi, was Will's good friends. And they were having several beers together, mourning the lives of these, uh, the loss of these lives of these students. And P.D. East really was kind of, pestering Will and said, okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Preacher Man, uh, your definition of the gospel, give me that definition again. And Will repeated it. He had one time asked P.D. East to, uh, P.D. East had asked him to sum up the gospel in 25 words or less, and Will said, I can do it in 10. And the, his summation of the gospel is this, we're all bastards, but God loves us anyway. Well, PDEs pressed this definition and said, are those students uh, bastards? Yeah, they are, but God loves them. And then he said, how about that sheriff? Well, he surely was a bastard, Will said. And then he broke because if he applied it to one, he had to apply it to all and had to confess and affirm and accept and embrace that the sheriff too was loved by God. It would cause a revolution in his thinking, and he would begin to think about doing a ministry to the people that he had run from most, much of his life, and that was the Cluxers down in Mississippi. He would always thereafter proclaim, be reconciled, be reconciled, come together. God has made you one. One time Will said, and I've used this frequently, he said, I would not have set up the world like God set it up, where everybody would be reconciled. I wouldn't have done it. He said, I would have set up some people as enemies and bopped them hard and punished them. But that's not what God does. God reconciles us all. I've used this quote from Thomas Merton to kind of flesh out what real reconciliation was and is and that it's not highfalutin theological nomenclature. It's real fundamental, basic stuff. What I wear is pants. What I do is live. How I pray is breathe. Up here in the woods is seen the word. That is to say the wind comes through the trees and you breathe it. If we could get everybody to understand that this is applicable to them, 
whether or not you wear pants, you may wear shorts or a dress or whatever, but what you wear is plain. And what we do is live and not pretend and not abide in some kind of, you know, overly dramatic kind of uh, posturing. What we do is breathe. That's how we pray. We pray, we just breathe in God's fresh air. The spirit is blowing in it. If we could get everybody to do that, that would be a moment of reconciliation. I have some suggestions for use, and these are taken from the handout that um, is already available on the website uh, for uh, the PDF. And there's seven of them, but I've just used three of these. Taking that one great quote of, we're all bastards, but God loves us anyway, uh, about as a focal point for considering our enemies, our enemies. How do we pray for the Taliban these days? I want to say that what they want to propose for women, or at least what I've heard, and what they've done, and how they've suppressed and oppressed women and girls, makes them my enemy. How do I pray for them? How or do I get the second half of that sentence to be applicable to them? We're all bastards. I think they're bastards for their attitudes towards women. But God loves us anyway. God loves them anyway. How do I get a hold of that? Pray by reciting the Lord's Prayer. This is the second suggestion I'm, I'm making. While pondering how Will understood this prayer to mean God has come on earth. He thought it very presumptuous, absolutely almost absurd to think that you could do theology or to use Frederick Buechner, that Hamlet could really understand what Shakespeare was doing in inscribing his character. Thirdly, despite the tragedies of everything that we behold that continue to bedevil us, Will would always be a person of hope. And by the way, he did chew tobacco. He did swear <laughs> like a sailor. Um, and he almost always did it in uh, the company of people that would be most upset about it. <laughs> just to yank their chain, just to rattle, kind of rattle their cage. But he always, always, always ended with hope. He did that at the end of correspondence and letters that he and I exchanged with notes and things like that, with books that he dedicated, with hope, with hope. How could you offer a hope of anticipation and hope for today? That's my suggestion for the third moment of uh, praying after Will Campbell's example. These are resources from film and video. The first, this USA Today from the Tennessean, is a great story. Um, and could we, we play this a little bit? Because it has a little bit of Will's voice in it. And it also has a wonderful kind of testimonial from Tom T. Hall. By the way, I'll tell you a, a wonderful story. Uh, some I have lots of stories of Will Campbell until the video comes on. Um, I got to kind of have fun with Will from time to time, and he had fun with me. One time we were trying to get him to uh, do a fundraising thing for Project Return. It was a nonprofit that I helped to create. By the way, it still exists, and you can go and uh, here we go. You can go. You know, he referred to himself as a preacher. You know, he, just, he didn't have a church. Uh, he didn't pass out any pamphlets and didn't take in any tithes and I don't know. Uh, uh, probably irreverent to say this, but uh, the only person that comes to mind who, who, who I would compare Will Campbell to would be Jesus. He just went through the world doing what he could at the time, wherever he was, you know because Will is so many things to so many people, I think. I mean, um, I try to explain to people who Will is if they haven't heard of him. And uh, I say he was a white Southern Baptist preacher from South Mississippi 
who was very involved in the civil rights movement and working uh, for the National Council of Churches um, at the time that the sit-ins began. Uh, he was one of the people who, um, who knew John Lewis and Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette and all those other uh, great heroes. He was, you know, there involved. When we had the sit-ins, for example, uh, Will would show up. He was there, an observer. We knew that there was somebody who cared and was concerned about what happened to us, okay? And he was in, in, involved, but not in direct action, okay? But he was directly involved. And uh, that was a thing that we felt when he was around, he represented that community of support he was reminding us that there were some white people, okay, who believed in what we were doing. And he never was one to, you know, step up into the middle of the fray and, and try to get people to behave differently. But whenever somebody was in trouble, you'd see him right around the edge of the He thing. was there. He was he was present. He 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 became intimate friends with a lot of people who were on the firing line in those things, but he was not himself uh, one of the standard bearers of uh, those protests. He felt his better role was to be the one who provided uh, aid and comfort to the people who were doing the heavy lifting. I aspired to understand him. Here was somebody who, who could talk seriously and, and uh, persuasively about uh, believing uh, that uh, Klansmen deserved their voice, believing that uh, uh, there was really no difference between atheists and, and devout Christians. Uh, believing that uh, abortion was sinful, believing that uh, uh, capital punishment was just another form of abortion, that you couldn't, you couldn't be against one and not be against the other and vice versa. I mean, I never understood a lot about him, but uh, he was no phony. People who had the good fortune to meet Will Campbell are, uh, are blessed with something because uh, in my travels, and I'm 76 years old and been all over the world, I only met one Will Campbell. Must be something special about him. Back to that page of resources. If you want to watch that, uh, if you were watching at the very beginning, uh, God's Will, that's the best video resource there is. And it's available free. It's about 58 plus minutes long. And it is excellent. It is absolutely excellent. Will is very challenging in the Racism in the Church uh, YouTube video, where he says, basically, it's been outlawed. It's been overcome in the school, in the courts. And by the way, he's not thinking it's been purely overcome, nor, uh, but it's statutorily it has been. And with regard to business, but he says, yet in the church, we're still separated. Yet in the church, the church, all churches are basically racist. Um, and then John Edgerton has a, uh, a wonderful article, lengthy, in uh, the Southern Spaces magazine. And John Ed Edgerton had a big speaking role in that little video snip that we just saw. So I would commend all of these for you for film, video, and internet resources. Next, I leave you with a picture of Will laughing um, in a story. Um, we were trying to get him to do a fundraising event for Project Return, and he loved us. He, he, he sent people to us all the time that prisoners that he knew for, from the main prison that had come to uh, 
get counsel from him. And um, we were a place where you could pretty much find a job. We had a we had an excellent record for helping prisoners, ex-prisoners, um, people on parole and probation find work. And we were known for this in Nashville. We would place about 500 ex-prisoners a year in uh, jobs. And Will would call upon us and we thought he'd return the favor. And so uh, we called him up one time and said, uh, this was like in September and the fundraiser was going to be, you know, we, we're responsible people. This is going to be next March. So we're way ahead of the game. Right. Um, and he says, well, excuse me, let me, he hated to do these things and he hated to say no. And he loved us, but with his impish sense of humor, he said, let me check something. So he hemmed and hawed. We don't know what he did on the other end of the line. He says, Oh no, I can't do it. I have a funeral that day. So that became my excuse when I didn't want to do something. So Brent, have, if I've ever said I had a funeral that day, it was in honor of Will Campbell. As Tom T. Hall said, no fake, completely authentic, and abiding in a little bit. You'll see this in, the, uh, in one of the video clips, a little bit of a, if you look up long enough on YouTube, there's a bunch of them that are connected to that one of racism in church. There's several before it and some after it. And you can just kind of click that. Will Campbell, Will D. Campbell, um, comma, uh, race, comma, or civil rights, comma, YouTube. And you can find a bunch of little snippets, one minute, two minute, three minutes. And um, Will participates, drinks a little bit at the Oasis of Mysticism. He does. He says, is there any moment when I'm not praying? If God is omniscient and omnipresent everywhere, if I really believe that, isn't every kind of thought I have already known by God and isn't that prayer? Yeah, this is an excellent article, excellent essay by John Edgerton. When I went to visit Will, I'd always uh, take him a fifth of either George Dickel or Evan Williams. He liked whiskey, but I also, Brenda, she didn't like bourbon or sour mash. She liked uh, scotch, and she liked Cuddy Sark, and that's what they would have as a toddy, as they called it, a toddy uh, of an evening. So I always took her a bottle of Cuddy Sark and him a bottle of, uh, of either Evan Williams or George Dickel. I'm a fan of Knob Creek myself. So if Will were alive today, we would probably talk some bourbon. He once gave me some moonshine and uh, it just kind of tastes like really bad lemonade. It wasn't very good. I think it had been spoiled and, or it wasn't good moonshine. Moonshine really can, you know, good moonshine can really pop a, a pop on you. And it's, it, you know, you're not going to go blind. I know a lot of people say, oh, no, you'll go blind. Well, yeah, if you you don't want to drink gasoline, you don't want to drink. you got a good you got to know the good moonshiners, you know. So, Bob, I have a question. Yeah, this is Liz. Um, I know we saw that he didn't prefer to be on the front line and he wasn't um, out there speaking like in the civil rights movement. But he still, it sounds like he was a person who was rather outspoken. Oh, yeah. So why do you think he's not more well-known? Like most of us have never heard of him before. Well, because you don't have video clips of him giving an oration in front of a big group of people. And that always gets the, the, the clamor. That always gets attention. But in the long run, it will be Will Campbell's writings and stories that we tell about him that um, that are remembered and emulated. So for example, at big old liberal Vanderbilt Divinity School, I was present for this. <laughs> I laugh every time I think of it. Will came to a forum and it was in the place where we got our mail, there was coffee, you know, kind of a, a socializing place where you could just kind of let your hand, it's where we had all of our parties eventually. It wasn't the refectory where we ate, but it was the commons, the student commons. And so there's lounge chairs there. And he was 
he was there with his hat, that Amish hat. And, uh, he had this, uh, mojo around him. He had a real fancy cane and, and there was a lot of black students there that had come from all across the country, uh, the campus, not just divinity school to hear this great civil rights leader and Kelly Miller Smith, his really, really great friend, black one of, and he joined Kelly's church, First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. And, and, and Kelly opened one door after another. And Will was more radical than even Kelly because he said, well, um, thank you for the invitation. I just want you to know that I'm pro Klansman. And the black leaders in the, in the group just said, we're out, we're out, get out. And got all their students and got him out. And he was intentionally provocative. He says, I didn't say I was pro-Klan. I said, I'm pro-Klansman because I have to be pro-human being for every child of God. And we need to talk about that aspect of the civil rights movement. So he knew what he was doing rhetorically, and performance-wise, he knew it. He knew that he would get a rise out of people. And, you know, then he got to unpack how, how radical is God's reconciling love. It's, it makes us do stuff we do not want to do. So he used that as a way of getting people's attention and sort of forcing them to back up and listen to him. Right, right. The, the thing is, Kelly Miller Smith loved him. Kelly Miller Smith is one of my great, great teachers. And he was kind of like the Martin Luther King of Nashville. It was at his church that the sit-in movement was organized. Um, Halberstan writes about this whole group and includes Will Campbell in a book called The Children, which you can get in your Mid-Continent Library, right, Brent? Uh, at any branch. And uh, Halberstam won, I think, maybe a, an award, either the National Book Award or the Pulitzer for the children. And in that, he tells a story of Will getting in John Lewis's face. When I went to visit Will, not this time, but another time, about 10 years after that picture was taken with me by the cabin, mm -hmm. I pressed him. I said, uh, John Lewis was in poor health at the time, and I wanted to know. And he said, John Lewis knew more about the power of nonviolence than any person in the movement. Wow. He came to a meeting at First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. Kelly Miller Smith is there. Diane Nash, Bernard Lafayette that you just saw on the video clip. Um, oh, man, John Lewis. And then there was, uh, oh, boy, the guy who trained them all. Um, Jim is his first name. I'll remember it later. Um, he was a Gandhian expert. And they had all decided that they would not go and do the sit-in the next day. John Lewis was habitually, chronically late. So he didn't get there for that decision. He just, okay, what time do we do the, the sit-in tomorrow? And they said, John, if you'd been here, you'd say we've already voted. And the powers that be downtown at Woolworths and Kresge's, they're all saying that it's too volatile. We should not go down there. It's too powers that be are telling us. Okay, when are we going to go to the sit-in? John had a speech impediment a little bit, and people thought he was slow-minded, to use a good country phrase. He wasn't. But they thought that upon first impression. If you didn't know him well, you didn't know how brilliant he was. And John said, okay. And they said, John, you didn't hear us. It's too volatile. The powers that be, the people in charge have told us it can't happen. Okay, what time do we go? <laughs> John, are you just so sinfully prideful? This is Will said that you, you don't get this. The people in charge, they kept telling them, the people in charge have told us it's too potentially violent. And John said, you don't get it. They're not in charge. And there was silence over the room and the whole room got converted to doing the sit-in because of John. And there was no violence the next day. 
they're not in charge. And Will said, John Lewis knew more about the power of nonviolence to move people and to transform history than anybody in the civil rights movement, period. And the name I was searching for is James Lawson, who was the teacher of all of those people and went to prison World War War II uh, out of his commitment to nonviolence. Will thought John Lewis knew more about nonviolence than even James Lawson. James Lawson was the white haired Afro guy, Afro quaffed man who eulogized John Lewis better than anybody uh, at Ebenezer Church uh, a few years ago. He's a powerful, powerful preacher. And he knew how powerful John Lewis was. Anyway, Will could identify and said, I was wrong to oppose John, and he knew about the power of nonviolence, and he taught us. Well, Will, writing about this, telling me, I've now told you, David Halberstam, Halberstam also tells this. Did he actually march with like Martin Luther King and yes. John He did. Yes, he did. When, when, he when he marched had... in, in Selma. Um, he was on the sidelines observing uh, in Birmingham. A lot of times he would not march because those guys got locked up and he would be rushing to get bail money to get them out. Gotcha. So, you know, it takes everybody. And he knew, you know, he knew every player in the entire civil rights movement, period. And they all knew him. I was thinking when John Lewis got hit in the head. Uh, and Selma, I don't think he was there when they crossed the, the Pettus Bridge. I think they were anticipating that there'd be a lot of people locked up and he was getting ready to bail them out. Gotcha. Okay. But I, I don't know if he was in that melee and, and, and a, a victim of the violence there. No, I don't think so. He was in Birmingham quite a bit. But you got to remember that the people, other than Fred Shuttlesworth uh, and a couple of other leading ministers, the Birmingham movement was composed in terms of the people that filled the jails of ch children and yeah. teenagers. It was called the Children's Crusade. Um, I do commend him. Uh, was exceedingly gentle as a person, although his wit would be caustic. And he challenged institutions almost unlike anybody experience. But his spirit was absolutely, like Tom T. Hall said, when you were with him, you felt a little closer to Jesus. Mm -hmm.